All right, so welcome everybody to the Working Weights LLC podcast. I'm your host, Coach Lambie, joined by Dwayne Ulrich, a.k.a. Poppy Dwarrel. What's happening? And we're going to be discussing the American Health and Nutrition Roundtable that was held in the Senate recently. A uh, pretty long event for watching, so this is definitely going to be a two-parter round one here i'm not even sure we're gonna get to everything we wanted to get to today but uh yeah. we'll try so uh i sent this to you pretty short notice that's probably why this is a two-parter um it was short notice for me too like i really maybe watched you know 20 minutes of it before i decide like oh we maybe should we should talk about this so and then asked you if there were some points that you really liked of you know how much of it that you were able to watch and so you wanted to focus on jordan peterson so yes. that's what we're going to start out with and then uh depending on how long we go we might get into casey means and then gosh i, f- I forget is that his the name. female yeah the, the lady with the blue dress yeah the party lady dress. with the blue dress blue dress blue dress lady with a blue dress on i thought that was weird <laughs> what she was wearing I'm not judging her for that, but it yeah, just didn't so seem she very... wore that. And then there was another guy, Max Lugavere, who must have, I don't know, rode his bicycle or something because he had like helmet ah. hair. Did you? I don't know if you saw it. He walked in looking like a bag of smashed nuts. I'm like, bro, you went to the Senate? So you have the dichotomy was, of him who versus was in party charge girl. of his appearance. <laughs> Anywho, without further ado. Oh man, you broke me up. I was trying to be all serious. <laughs> oh man, uh, here I am dressed in my little throwdown shirt. Uh, no, I'm in a I'm in my sweater. My heater broke, man. Oh no. The the one that we had in the garage for yeah, all those years fi- finally yep. went out. Wow. That was a great heater too. Pretty good, pretty good deal though. I think I bought that heater off of Amazon for like sixty bucks. Awesome. I got a ton of use out of it, and yeah. it uh, it will heat up an area. For those of you that we have, well, for everybody, that little heater, it, it heated the garage, which he had converted to our gym. Yeah, two car uh, garage, you know, floor floor matting and stuff, and it was just all the all the workout gear and all the the racks were there and. That thing, it could be 40 degrees outside, and it was toasty inside that room. Yeah, it, it, it warmed it up. It does a pretty good job in here, and I don't have the um, I don't have any drywall on the ceiling like I did in Texas. I put the drywall in the ceiling in Texas yeah. yep. you know, to yep. minimize that heat and cold transfer. And even in here, like it'll, it'll heat up this little area. Oh, excuse me. It'll heat up this area. Um, now, of course, my garage is two times maybe even three times the size it was in Houston, but it does a pretty good job of heating up this area. Like I can sit and have a podcast as long as I turn it on a couple hours in advance, <laughs> but it's dead now. Yeah. Anywho, let's get into this thing. Let's hear what Jordan Peterson has to say. Thank you very much, Senator. And it is a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm speaking today as a clinical research scientist. This is an endeavor with, I, with which I have some familiarity because I've conducted many such studies and I'm aware of their difficulty. I'm also speaking as a clinician and a parent and a sometime philosopher of science. We'll start with the general in this discussion and move towards the specific. Generally, it's vital to understand that science... Dwayne, you stop me whenever you want to bring up points. Okay. Is that like at double speed or half speed? Yes, this is at 1.5. Okay, cool, cool. Go ahead. This itself is an ethical, even a philosophical slash religious enterprise. Why? because the scientists who advance humanity inevitably operate within an a priori framework of faith. What are the elements of that faith? Belief that the world is orderly in its foundation, its nature and its spirit. Belief that such order is understandable to the mind of man and woman. Belief that the pursuit of such understanding is possible and laudable. And a belief that good itself will come of the pursuit of understanding. There's a meta principle that underlies these more explicit rules, and that is that the understanding, the understanding that the scientific aim must be true for the truth to be revealed. This- uh, okay, so I'm going to stop here because, like, 
it maybe sounds like gobbledygook to some people. Um, what Jordan Peterson is talking to is about the um, uniformity of nature. So the reason that we do science and we evaluate evidence is that we have this underlying foundational principle that the future is going to be like the past. Otherwise, doing science would be pointless because one plus one might equal two today. But if we can't rely on the fact that the future will be the same as it is today, one plus one might equal 3,000 tomorrow. Um, and these are these are Judeo-Christian fundamentals that he's talking about. Uh, now, to the point of the meta argument that he brought up, uh, that the aim of the science must be to find the truth so that the truth can be revealed is uh <laughs> let's go to the tree proof generator here what yeah tree proof generator here we go so what he's saying is that um uh if p then q so if the aim of the science is to find the truth then the truth will be revealed and um, many of the arguments throughout this uh, discussion was that there is um, corruption happening through the level. So he's saying uh, it's not the case that the the aim of the science is to be is to find the truth. Uh, therefore, the truth will not be revealed. Do you think I'm representing that correctly? I think, I think he goes on a little bit. Let me let me fin let him finish his point. Is that science aimed at career, prestige, professorship, and funding, to say nothing of darker motivations such as pride, revenge, or the wish for destruction, is not science at all. Much. Okay. Yeah. So, so if, if the science, if the aim of the science is to discover the truth, then the truth will be revealed. If the aim is for political motivation, then you won't. The truth won't be revealed if the aim is for career advancement then the truth won't be revealed so if p then q not p therefore not q this isn't even a logically valid argument yes uh, i however i i'm just going to throw out there that uh, to take an opposite side of the, kind of that coin is i just don't think he said it very well and if we look back at the whole covid um, episode in our history. There's a lot of interesting things that happened there. So science, science, which people often commute, com confuse with actually with that, with medicine. So science, if science is looking for truth, uh, truth is out there, but science did not present truth to the globe. Uh, it just didn't. Um, and so I think that what he says to a certain, to a certain extent has some validity. So what he said was much of what purports to be science now is instead the garnering of personal credit, career advancement, economics gain, not just for personal, but for a, a corporate level. Uh, and I, I don't know that I can argue that against that because that's kind of what we saw. Uh, it's still not a logically valid argument. It's not a logically have... valid argument. The way he's right. putting this it is out a there, logic... absolutely. The foundation of the argument is fallacious. This is a, fa a formal fallacy called denying the antecedent, which is to assume that just because the first thing is not true, the second thing won't be true. Uh, and we talked about this recently. So if I yeah, say... If I say if P then Q, so if it's raining, then the ground will be wet. It's not raining, therefore the ground will not be wet. Well, that's not true because there are other reasons the ground can be wet. So just because the aim of science may not be to to discover the truth doesn't mean that the truth can't be discovered from that science. So just because someone may be trying to advance their career and they're, um, they're conducting science uh, – with that specific aim doesn't mean we won't discover truth from that. That's true. <laughs> that is so, true. That is true. The, however, the, however, uh, what what we what what the end user gets, what the average person gets from that, isn't necessarily going to be the truth. 
it doesn't mean that science can't find the truth. It just means that we don't, we're not going to see that until afterwards. Um, oh, wait. Uh, so let me see if the aim of the science, uh, cause that doesn't seem logically valid either. That seems like, a well, think about it. So, so, let me just throw it out there and then you can work through it for me. So think about it. Let's just look at, let's just look at, let's just look at COVID. Okay. So here's COVID comes at us and we come up with this great vaccine, MRNA, which is an MRNA type of the science is an MR, mRNA intervention, but point being is, is so we have that and, oh, we're going to vaccinate everybody with it. Okay. However, it doesn't work. People got the shot. They still got sick. They got the boosters. They still got sick, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then what the science said that wasn't science, wasn't valid, worked, but those folks that, that were using that were saying, oh, you guys are crazy. It doesn't work. Okay. Well, the science has been proven a long time ago that it does work. But we're saying, but we're told this is science. This is what the science says. No, no. You guys made a trillion dollars and uh, people died on science that was not valid. Um. So that's by the way I, if i, I don't have if the, I, I don't have i don't have the detail i can't give you this the, the studies right now but that's truth and that's proven that's proven um we're, so, at, we're okay, at an impasse so I, think, <laughs> yeah, I think what you're i think what you're referring to is that is that um uh so the initial things about so the health crisis roundtable was isn't about COVID, but no, you're trying not. to draw a parallel. That um, is a, and I think what you're referring to is where they were telling you if you got the vaccination, then it would stop the spread of COVID, which which ended up not being true. Not only the spread of COVID, but you getting COVID, and it didn't work. And yeah, yeah, okay. it's not, yeah this isn't um, necessarily about COVID. But this is an example of like a kind of what they're talking at the round table, all this, this myriad of things that's happening in our, in, at least in the United States, but also globally about here's the science, here's medicine. And there you go. Yeah. So this is, so P is the aim of science is to seek truth. Q is truth will be revealed. R is people will, I can't do that. Because R has to be a positive. People will get the truth. Is that fair? Yep. All right. So if the aim of science is to seek the truth, then the truth will be revealed. The aim of science is not to seek the truth. Therefore, people will not get the truth. Yes. It's a faulty syllogism. So... Well. I, have, I don't know what to. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Maybe so we're the just main, not. Maybe we're just not main, working it right. The main premises. Uh, I, yeah, there may. I mean, there may be some. So, I mean, I find I find issue with everything I listened to in the whole thing because most of it results in a faulty syllogism or some other uh, formal fallacy where the structure of the argument leads to it being invalid, such as the one Jordan Peterson presented. So the foundation of the arguments is fallacious. And I find it discouraging to hear an argument like that from Jordan Peterson. I like Jordan Peterson. Nobody get me wrong out there. I have his book. I read his book. I thought it was fantastic. He's done a lot of stuff with free speech that I think is wonderful and great. On this front... Uh, I, it's, it's discouraging to hear this from him. What purports to be science now is instead the garnering of personal credit, career advancement, and economic gain that all derivative and essentially parasitic activity can temporarily produce. This not, does not result in truth. We should also... That's not the case. I just demonstrated that. 
the ground can still be wet even if it's not raining. Not be confusing medicine, as currently taught and practiced, with science. The education of modern physicians may familiarize them with the basics of physiology and biology and the details of their specific practice. This is by no means the same thing as teaching them how to conduct or evaluate scientific research, which is something... Now, that point's valid. That's a good point, right? Um, just because you went to school and you learned um, biology, biochemistry, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, in order to practice medicine doesn't mean that you're qualified to uh, read and evaluate the scientific literature. Uh, I don't disagree with that. You brought that up earlier. I did, yeah, yeah. It takes years of specialized training to manage. Why am I making these points? So that we understand explicitly that aim and ethical orientation define the scientific pursuit. And so that we pay enough attention here today to establishing that aim and ensuring that orientation. When you're a scientist and you're doing statistical analysis, it's easy to believe, for example, if you don't know anything about science or statistical analysis, that the statistical process is a mathematics machine into which you pour data and crank out truth. And that is just absolutely not how it works at all. When you're doing statistical analysis, you're making a thousand micro decisions, every single one of which is ethical. You have to decide which numbers to include and which numbers to exclude, and you have to understand why. And you have to work against your own hypothesis and even against your own research interests to ensure that you're not deluding yourself in the public. And if you're a careerist or interested in prestige, then all of that goes out the window and what you produce will be highly misleading to you and everyone else. It's very uh, all of that's true, man. Uh, the, yeah. the issue that I have is that it's, if, uh, if, if your aim is the pursuit of career advancement or, uh, you know, I forget like everything he said, but if that aim is that way and you conduct the research in that manner, we can go through your work and find, uh, how, you know, through the methodology of, of your research, how, you know, that aim ends up producing the results or the conclusion that you're looking to get. We can we can discover that in the methodology. We've done that several times uh, on this podcast where we go through something and just because, you know, we we did intervention X and we ended up with outcome Y, you know, sometimes it would be expected for outcome Y because of certain reasons like, well, yeah, you conducted the research in a manner that it's expected to get that outcome. What I'm not he seeing or hearing from anybody at this today is any evidence showing me the methodology that results yes. in, you know what I mean? Yes. So yes. That's, yes. Where, yes. that's where the leap in logic um, that I find discouraging is being made here. We're just, we're jumping over, you know, the smoking gun, so to speak, yes. that would lead us to that conclusion. That's why these arguments are invalid is because there's a portion missing. Yes, let me let me speak to that real quick also. So for those of you listening and, and watching, so when um when Coach talked to me, he mentioned this to me and I started looking at it. And and I think one of the things that I said in in a response to him on my in a text message, I said, well, wait, where's their data? Okay, so yeah. we, the guys before and after Jordan Peterson, and he doesn't throw out a whole lot of of uh, numbers and percentages because it's very common for people to say, well, for example, one of them is uh, somebody put out there like 70% um, of all uh, youth in America are obese. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not true. Wh where does that data come from? Mm -hmm. Where does that data come from? Let's see that data. And then speaking to what you just said, so I was part of an organization, doesn't need to be said, you know, it's my secret spy days, but we would put out these reports on, say, crime uh, in city of whatever. And we would put out this, these, this data. And then in that data, we would show that we could show that, hey, crime has decreased over the last three months. And mm -hmm. then we show the numbers and people go, hey, yay. I'm ashamed to say that I was part of that. I was part of developing those program, those reports sometimes. And, you know, what we did was like, if there was a lot of crime going on, well, we just shifted our date. We shifted mm -hmm. our reporting date down by like maybe three to five days, maybe mm -hmm. a week. Yeah. And oh my gosh. And then suddenly all that stuff changed. So now we can say, oh, we've successfully, you know, limited, we've successfully eliminated crime in this area, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. It just looked like we did. Mm -hmm. And the public is only is only um, 
they only had access to those base numbers that we produced. Okay. Uh, it's the same thing with the FBI. Oh, crime is on, on, on the down when it's not, but they eliminated certain cities and it made that change. Well, how would you know that? You can't know that unless you have access to that data. Right. So these guys that are telling us like, well, 70% of all, you know, okay, maybe they are, but show us the data, show us the data. Yeah. Did that, um, did that, did that, was it, did that help or? Yeah. So, so there are, there are a, a plethora of extraordinary claims that have been made um, in, I don't know, I watched maybe half of it. I don't know how much you watched, uh, but there, are, there, are, there are extraordinary claims that are made and there are a lot of specific numbers and statistics that have been thrown around. There were no references provided for anything. Uh, in fact, the only thing that we really hear is online anecdote reporting. Yes. Yeah. That's the only thing that was referenced. And so uh, so that's the main issue that I have. So I I, I, I think it's fair to, to look at the things that they're looking at. And I guess people are probably lost because no one has listened to the whole thing like we have, but... Uh, it, yeah, let's first, let's, let's first of all, on. it's a brutal, it's a brutal listen. It's this is three hours long, over three hours, and so yeah. it was it was a brutal listen. Let's go on and listen to what Jordan Peterson has to say. It's very difficult to orient yourself so that you fight against that. You have to be terrified of the falsehoods that you might produce and where they might lead you and everyone else. And so now, having considered that, you have to start to understand what it is that should constitute your aim. What would require in the case that we're discussing to make. So, uh, right, just quick. So he brings up another valid point is that you have to fight against your own hypothesis. You have to try very hard to disprove your own hypothesis. And so um, as we go through this, however many parts this takes, you're going to see me showing that I don't think that a lot of people worked very hard to disprove their own hypotheses. America, true, yes, and, again. And to orient truth. Good. I was going to say yes. It's, and that's... That kind of goes back to my conversation earlier about, okay, who's who's to benefit? Who's going to benefit? So if we can make trillions of dollars on something, how interested are we really going to be in trying to make, you know, trying to look at both sides to get truth, to be, to be non-biased in our uh, collection, our study, uh, how we do the, do the, uh, the tests and the studies. And be open to what comes out at the end. How you you have to want to be down the middle. You have to really concentrate on that. But I'm just saying I, there are organizations out there now that they're not really interested in that. They're really interested in looking good or making money. So the numbers that we hear uh, from one side or the other, man, we don't without seeing the data. This side could be making it look really good for their side this guy can be mm -hmm. making it look really good for their side so show us the numbers show us the study i'm so sorry I, just, I get really fired up about it yeah I, i'm on board that aim it's a retooling of the research enterprise from the top down as well as the bottom up so that the goal would be clear the incentive oh geez i see i have a problem with that too from the top down and the bottom up that's contradictory um, yeah. It just sounds like sloganeering, and I'm not really sure what it even means. Is aligned, and the most productive actors identified, rewarded, encouraged, and capitalized. This could be facilitated politically by making a more specific goal clear. We could begin that, as we should, by formulating an appropriate diagnosis. We need to get the problem right. What is the major problem? What are the major problems bedeviling the American people? One such is public health, clearly, and more so all the time. Despite the extensive government spending in that domain, and despite the negligible attention historically paid to the details of health research and practice by the political class, mm. I got a hit on the on the uh, the health crisis. So, it like, um, yeah, di uh, yeah, diabetes, obesity, all these things are going up. Um, and several people here mentioned, you know, despite the health cost. Well, it seems to me that like the more sick you are, the more you're going to spend in healthcare costs. So I'm not even sure why there seems to be an assumption that the two are mutually exclusive. The one results in the other. People who are sicker have to spend more on, on medical care. Um, you know, otherwise you 
just remain sick and miserable and die. So, uh, I mean, it just, I'm not sure. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I don't understand why they're saying, despite how much we spend on medical care, it seems that as people get sicker, they have to spend more on medical care. Like the reason we spend so much is because people are getting sicker. So, so I just want to challenge that for a second. So being sicker, I don't, I, I agree with you to a certain point, uh, coach, but on, by the same token, so say a doctor puts you on a particular medicine, then you go, you go get your, you put your prescription in at the drugstore and you're not really sick. It's just something that, that helps you. Maybe it's a thyroid medication maybe it's a, you know, a, a mild blood thinner, uh, you know, which is a little bit stronger than say aspirin or whatever. And then you go to the drugstore and you put that in, instead of expecting your insurance to cover it and you pay $20 or $40 or whatever, the cost of that medication is 900 bucks. Really? What's so special about that medication that cost it $900 and it does just a little bit more than aspirin? Um, that's, I mean, that's I don't, a, that's I a don't, true case, by the way, that's a true case. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that changing the cost of the prescription changes what I'm saying. So if you require a thyroid medication, regardless of what that thyroid medication costs, a person that requires the medication is going to spend more on medical care than someone who does not require it. Yes, and I agree with that. I agree right. with that. But we're not talking a person the, who's crippled. It's just this person. It's just a slight. It's a slight tuning of his medication. Maybe you just up your. Maybe you just up your testosterone just a touch, and then that just that touch. The next medication, the next hottest medication to come out of the uh, of the pharma pharmacology uh, big pharma, happens to be nine hundred bucks instead of sixty bucks that you normally pay. So that's, that's, that's something to think about. Does that, is that person sicker? Maybe a little bit, but to the point of that astronomical jump in cost, I don't know. I think yeah, there's a point to I be made there. But a, I, I, but, yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. I think that there's a point to be made that, um, but it also, there's an also uh, like a point of, um, of like, we don't understand why that medication costs that much. It sounds ridiculous to charge $900 for something that's potentially life-saving to somebody. Um, and it may be the case that, that you know, they're upcharging it. And I don't disagree that, like, the way that it, it costs $900 because um, the way that that insurance and everything runs in this country Right. So because insurance pays for something, then we see prices get jacked up for certain a lot of things. Um, so I don't I don't disagree with that at all. But it's just to say, like, people are sicker despite spending more. It, like if people yeah, oh, I agree were with healthier, I, if people were healthier, yes. we would spend yes. less. So I don't see how the two things are mutually exclusive. People are sicker yes. despite spending more. It doesn't, that doesn't seem to make sense because if people get sicker, they are going to spend more than if they were healthy, regardless of what the medication costs. You That's I mean? true. I'll, I'll submit to that. Even if, it, even if it was a dollar, you're going to be spending a dollar yeah. more than you yeah. would have otherwise. Yeah, I stipulate that. However, I just want to say this for those of you that <laughs> listen to our podcast, resistance training, get outside, walk, eat yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You're going, to be, you're going to be way better off. <laughs> to all of those. American children are fat, diabetic, and increasingly miserable. As they progress towards middle age, those yet not captured in childhood. You got to stop. By okay. American children are fat and diabetic. Okay, that, I can't agree to that argument. I mean, all American children are fat and diabetic. Isn't that what he just said? American children are fat. And it diabetic. was yes, yes. It's an overgeneralization. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. To, so, but to say like we can infer what he's saying, like it's it's higher now than has been in the past. Yes. I I don't disagree. 
obesity, we're fatter. insulin resistance, yeah. high blood sugar, and inflammatory dysfunction are likely to suffer it then, with near certainty by the onset of a declining old age, and expensively so. What might, what might we aim for instead? Slim, healthy, athletic, optimistic, and courageous children. Strong, psychologically integrated, generous adults. Resilient, active, productive seniors still contributing to their communities. Combined with either or both of much less spending or much better results for the cost. How could this aim be accomplished within the community of health-focused researchers and practitioners and incentivized politically? America faces a multi-dimensional diagnostic conundrum. Its people suffer from a plethora of symptoms and syndromes. Too high and increasing body mass indices, rising blood sugar levels, associated risk for psychological disorder, immunological dysregulation that increases risk of neurological degeneration, cancer and heart disease, to name a few. My daughter referred earlier to her terrible childhood experiences, inquiry and experimentation, communication of all that, and the social consequences among a multitude of people with various chronic health conditions. What was her prime scientifically relevant realization? The answer to this question. What do all fat, sick, unhappy people have in common? At least this. They all eat. So I have to make a point here, and this again, I'm just disappointed. What do all fat, sick unhealthy people have in common they all eat as opposed to slim fit athletic people right who don't eat well yeah, or, his, or his, who don't have that in common with those people like i his uh, argument's not valid that's not a, it's not a good argument yeah no. how could that brute and singular fact be varied and studied is that technical uh, and it is you know like point of fact true that they all eat uh, however, there are all of those things that he listed, the aims that we should have for our youth, uh, our, our aging populations and everything, those people eat as well. Discourse on the formulation of adequate scientific hypotheses. Epidemiological studies associating any given dietary habit with some outcome of health inevitably fail. Remember this. Epidemiological studies associating any given dietary habit with an outcome inevitably fail. Trying as they are to establish a correspondence between only two factors in a sea of causal possibility. Dwayne, we've looked at several epidemiological. Do they only look at two factors? No. 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 And it's just and I love the point you just made. I think a lot of people may have glossed over that because, you know, they're listening to Jordan speak so fast and they're going, what? What? What's mm -hmm. happening? What's happening? these dietary things inevitably fail. And haven't we talked about that? We've gone over quite a few epidemiological studies. Uh, and they, they ultimately fail. Do they? Well, as far as diets go, and that, that's what I took from what he just said. No, is, he's, so he's saying looking at a a dietary variable with an outcome so for instance red meat and the correlation with colorectal cancer he's saying that inevitably fails what he's actually specifically referring to is uh something like saturated fat and and its effect on heart disease oh yeah yeah I see. so he he's not saying he's not well, saying I misunderstood what he people said start there. a diet people start a diet and the diet fails my bad. Uh, yeah, that, that that point comes up later, though. So what he's what he's referring to are are like the the nurses health study, the health professionals follow up study, which we um, look at a lot. He doesn't ever refer to those. He's referring specifically to the seven countries study. Ah. Uh, um, now I'm putting words into his mouth. However, I watch a lot of Jordan Peterson. Like I said, I like Jordan Peterson, um, and he's what he's referring to is the seven countries study. Science can only right. progress, genuine science can only progress when such inquiry is simplified radically so that single variables of interest can be assessed for causal significance. This is difficult to manage in the case of diet, but it no longer seems impossible. The reason? Because of the actual possibility of radical simplification on the food consumption side. Elimination diets offer a potential solution to this problem. Most of them make little sense, however, conceptually or scientifically. They eliminate foods in an often random and faddish manner, often because of the spoken or unspoken ideological concerns of their proponents. In addition, they're insufficiently simple. The range of foods involved, so that scientific analysis of causality can take place, must be reduced to the minimum for genuine analysis of causality to take place. You're chronically ill. 
You have a plethora of symptoms. You eat a multitude of foods. There's some relationship between the food and outcome, at least in principle. How are you going to determine that? Well, no simple analysis is possible because of the multiplicity of factors, both on the symptom side and on the dietary side. So you reduce the complexity of your diet, optimally to a single variable. Well, that's what my daughter Michaela did. So here's, um, here's what he's saying, because this probably sounds like gobbledygook. So he has an issue with the way epidemiology is conducted. So we send out food frequency questionnaires to people. And we say, hey, we looked at the food frequency questionnaires, right? How, mm -hmm. many, how, how often do you eat this food, that food, the other food, and whatnot? And then we take other things as well, like who smokes, what medications you're on, um, yeah. height and weight, and all those things. We bring them back. And we put them through several statistical models to, to um, remove the statistical effect that each of those one things may have on the outcome that we're looking for in question. So we're looking at red meat. Let's say we're looking at saturated fat and, and heart disease, right? So we send out a bunch of food frequency questionnaires. People eat a whole bunch of different things. People eat varied diets. And so we're getting all of these different variables that we have to input into the model. And so what he's saying is, well, you can't rely on that because there are so many variables to account for. And instead, what we should do is have everyone reduce their diet to one item and yeah, do, but... that, do that for 30 to 50 years. Yeah. And he's so he's saying on the one hand, it's hard to it's hard to um, discover the truth the way that we're currently doing it. And what would be easier is if everyone just ate one food. Right. Well, that's not reliable. I mean, that's not that's. Yeah, it's it's impractical at the least. Um and the other thing is you're going to end up with many of the same problems because people aren't going to be able to do that for it. Well, what do you plan to do? Put them in a concentration camp? Yeah, I'm not That's really quite sure. That's the only way his... you could do it. Yes, I'm I'm not really quite sure how his daughter did that. But I mean, I'm glad it worked for her. But yeah, it's the it's much more complex than just cutting it's, everything yeah, down to one hard. food. You just First of all, you can't just it's it'd be seriously difficult to survive on one food or one food item. That's yeah. Food. yeah. Okay. You can only eat rice. You're in our, you're in our, in our concentration camp. We're only going to be rice and water. Maybe you're still sick. Oh, we're going to keep you just rice, no water. Here's, here's the other problem with this. For right? 50 we, years. Yeah. We take everyone. Let's say that people have some intolerance to one, item or another. maybe they have an intolerance to 10 things that they're eating and you put them on an elimination diet by removing those things uh and he's not incorrect in what he's saying right so remove everything down to one and then slowly reintroduce them so you remove all of these things and we see these these intolerance issues go away in people now what he's suggesting is everyone uh, go down to beef the problem is, is that we can put everyone on a dog poop diet and achieve the same results. So it does. It, I'm not wrong. So on that basis, I of, cannot if we participate take, in that diet. <laughs> if I take 500,000 people, I put them in a concentration camp and I give them a diet of only dog food and or dog, dog poop and water, and they achieve the same results that Michaela Peterson achieved. Are we now supposed to believe that the optimal diet for people is dog poop? Dog poop, right. On the basis of what he's saying, you would have to accept those results. Yeah, well, it, so ultimately it's too simplistic. It's just too simplistic because there are too many other factors. Yes, that's too right. Many, even too many if, other factors. Even if you were to reduce your food variable down to one, there are any other multitude of factors that could be causing these issues. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Now we know some things absolutely. about such reduction. These are things that are important to know. Ketogenic diets switch the body to fat metabolism, so they constitute a step in that direction. If you flip your body to fat metabolism and your, and your symptoms decline... This is incorrect as well. Your body is always um, doing both things. You're, you're burning sugar and you're burning fat at the same time. So there's no, like, switch that is flipped. Um, 
gosh, I don't know how to put this. Let's say a flex fuel vehicle. A flex fuel, fuel vehicle can run on two different types of fuels, right? Right. So let's say that if I'm putting both types of fuel in the tank, I'm burning both of those fuels all of the time, right? But if I stop putting one in and I start putting the other in, I've suddenly started burning more of that fuel. Right. But it's not it's not because some switch was flipped. It's because right. I'm not putting the other fuel in. Right. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good example. Absolutely. And, and you know that the metabolic illness that you're suffering from has some association with glucose metabolism. Now, Mikhail, I believe, or perhaps that's not true either. Just because you just because you stop eating carbohydrates and you find some improvement does not mean that there's an issue with glucose metabolism. Yeah, because Michaela mentioned the fact that uh, for a century... Oh, let me put it to you this way. If you have Crohn's and you eat gluten, you will experience uh, intolerance issues eating gluten. But that doesn't mean that gluten is the cause of Crohn's. Yes. Yes. Childhood yes. epilepsy has been treated with a ketogenic diet because your brain won't go into convulsions if you're not feeding it sugar. That's a good example of simplification to a single variable. Now, another alternative or associated uh, issue with ketogenic diets is restriction of carbohydrate and sugar intake. So they eliminate the contribution of the glucose-dependent metabolic pathway to obesity, insulin resistance, slash diabetes, and inflammation. Your body can burn sugar or it can burn fat. And in our society, we run primarily on glucose metabolism, but there's no necessity for that, not least because there is no recommended daily allowance for carbohydrate. Right. You can live with zero carbohydrate. And zero is not a lot. You can live with zero of a lot of things. That doesn't mean that that's the best thing for you. Oh, that's a remarkable fact in and of itself, given that the primary caloric source in our diet that we have. Uh, so this is interesting, too. So, uh, you know, can you live with zero carbohydrate? Number one, I don't think that that's uh, that hypothesis is even testable because there's some amount of carbohydrate in everything you eat. Agreed. Including, Agreed. including meat, because um, yeah. animals including humans, store carbohydrate in the meat in the form of glycogen. So there is some form of carbohydrate that is happening. Also, your body will convert protein into carbohydrate, into glucose, um, through the process of gluco gluconeogenesis. So the hypothesis isn't even testable. I understand what he's saying, um, but to the other point is that he's recommending an all-meat, high-animal-fat diet. Well, we don't, there's no daily requirement for saturated fat. You can live without, with zero saturated fat in your diet. Right. Actually, I was just going to say the same thing as uh, about the carbohydrates. There's carbohydrates in almost, in almost every, not everything, but in almost everything we eat. And even with, like you said, even in, in meat. Yeah. So you could do, you want to do a carbo or, or carb free, or you're not doing carbs. Um, and I know people doing that, but all they're doing is they're reducing a, a, a larger supply of carbs. Not you can't you can't eliminate carbohydrates out of all of your food. Uh, yeah, maybe if there, you just drink water. There are also, but... I mean, there's the flip side to this as well. Like there is such a thing called a rice diet. There is such a thing yes. called the potato diet, where people talk only about consume that. rice and only consume potatoes. Yes. Uh yes. so you know what I mean, like. Oof. Carbohydrate. Yeah. So that can be eliminated and the consequences analyzed, and that can happen relatively quickly, and people can do it, and it's inexpensive, and it doesn't harm people. So those are all very good things from a research perspective. Okay. See, now this, I, I take issue with this to say that it doesn't harm people. A little off the rails there. Uh, I looked this stuff up in advance. Okay. So he talked about. Um, using a ketogenic diet for epilepsy. A ketogenic diet is for um, drug-resistant epilepsy in children has been shown to be uh, effective. It's not It's not <clears throat> as effective as people think it is. Um, yeah, so let me see. So it doesn't harm people. Um, so the re so, yeah, uh, adverse reactions associated with administration of a ketogenic diet. So this is 1998 multi-center study, 51 children. Adverse reactions, severe dehydration or acidosis, lethargy, som somnolence, severe infections, mood swings, vomiting, and constipation. Reasons for discontinuing treatment were intolerance, difficulties in ma maintaining restricted diet, and inadequate seizure control. In the same year, a group from John Hopkins, authors noticed 
uh, and you can look at the size of frequency. Like it's actually not that great. 47 children remained on the diet for a year. Like that's a pretty drastic dropout rate. Uh, 39% controlled 50 to 90% of the seizures, like less than half of people mm -hmm. had relatively good seizure control. Um, do, 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 do. Children had decreased in seizures. Yeah, yeah, 70. Uh, the effectiveness of the ketogenic diet was significantly higher in cases children discued continued their diet due to distaste and 3.7 experienced vomiting and nausea. Um, yeah, so there's there is a whole plethora of adverse reactions that have been documented um, in this. Uh, there are also two recorded deaths in children. Here you go. Inadequate of 17 micronutrients. Get out of here. Children have gotten scurvy. Some have even died from deficiency of mineral selenium on a ketogenic diet being treated for epilepsy. So let's not pretend that this recommendation is without consequence. Yeah, and it, and it's not it's not um, it's a trend. It's a trend. It's a partial thing. So it's like not hundred percent. Didn't change hundred percent kids and remove and, and eliminate epilepsy. It just right. some people did better. Some people didn't. So that's not it, that's not it a, can yeah it can be used. Some people <laughs> respond to it. Some people respond very well. So there were people. There were children who got you know ninety percent of seizure remissions. Uh, it's not a, a huge percent. Um, so let's <laughs> it's got to be a way better thing than maybe and not that it's this number but it's got to be a way better uh, outcome it's... than 50 50 you know if you oh yes. 50 50 chance the, that's yeah, not good enough to make to make a to make a public based recommendation for the ketogenic diet on the basis that it it's been used to treat epilepsy uh and at best, it, at best, the treatment resulted in 50-50 results for epilepsy. At best. At yeah. best. Um, uh, so I don't I don't think it's arguing from a great position to say, let's do this nationwide. Yeah. Effective. The consequence of a ketogenic intake, switch to ketogenic intake, can be analyzed as well. You can monitor weight, blood sugar, and assorted symptoms of inflammation, including those associated with psychological disorder. The anecdotal evidence that we've picked up, because many, many people have communicated with our family, is that the typical obese person can expect to lose 7 to 20 pounds per month on a ketogenic or plant-free ketogenic diet, that that will continue month after month until virtually all of their body fat is eliminated, that they can do that with no hunger, although there will be some cravings, which are not... Is that an epidemiological association that he's found? Did he say plant-free? Plant-free. Yeah, so all-meat diet. Carnivore diet. Uh, Michaela Peterson's deal, she calls it the lion diet, so it's only beef and lamb and salt and water. But anywho, I thought all epidemiology that tries to establish uh, a dietary habit with an outcome fails. That's what he right? said earlier. That's what he now, said. Now he now he's saying, "Well, look at all these anecdotes we've heard." Yeah, he he's contradicted himself. Yep. Basically, the same thing, and that that's actually maintainable over the long run. With that reduction in obesity comes. Uh, it actually does not appear to be maintainable over the long run. It's not. It's not. Uh, so a ketogenic diet is not more. What's the word? People don't adhere to a ketogenic diet more than any other dietary pattern within the scientific literature. Uh, we talked about the Verda Health trial before. Yes, yes, yes. You see Verda Health. We got 3.5 year. Yeah, this one right here. So this is five year follow up from Verda Health. Um, and uh, I did the math on this beforehand. So the recidivism rate, the dropout rate from the beginning of the trial to five years was 65%. Now, this trial is not a randomized control trial where people were recruited and then randomized to groups. This company sells uh, basically diet coaching. So all of the people in this trial paid 
to be in the trial. They were paying for the advice mm-hmm. to, to be on a ketogenic diet, to lose weight, to improve their diabetes, to lower their medication costs, all that stuff. 65% recidivism rate for people who wanted to be there. Right. And then in the end, when we talk about the um, the weight loss, so they you know they went from 116 kilograms to 107. That's only maybe more than a little more than five percent. In the mm-hmm. beginning, I think they lost uh, close to 15 percent of weight loss. So at one year, the weight loss was drastic. By five years, they've gained almost all of it back. We've looked at that curve too, by the way, or that yeah. that that chart. Yeah. And then from the from the stance, he's saying obesity and diabetes. Well, here you go. Here's the diabetes results. People went from being diabetic to being diabetic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not we, I don't I don't see where the evidence is to suggest that this is going to f- address this problem nationwide. It's certainly going to help some people. But it didn't so, even help. It didn't even help you know, the, the majority of people within this one, this individual trial. And, and this go is, ahead. wait, go back to that, go back to that page. Mm-hmm. And so this is also very, this is also uh, reflective of basically all diets. There is a recidivism, recid, that word, recidivism. Yeah, that people drop people, out. It's, it, 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 they're just, they're just unsustainable. But I want you to look at what they put down for the conclusion over five years follow-up. The VLCI with CRC showed excellent retention, sustained mm-hmm. clinically significant weight loss, and stable glycemic control with reduced dependency on anti-diabetic medications. Wait a minute. You just proved that, that that's not true. Yeah. And we, we, you know, like I think the I think the initial enrollment was 349 people. Um, uh, and you can see here. Patients consented to the extension, 122 people out of 349. Remained after five years. Remained after five years. It goes back to my argument. It goes back to our conversation earlier. Who's, I didn't mean to cut you off, Coach. Go ahead. It goes back to our our, our conversation from earlier. Did they maintain a a non-biased look at that? Look at their conclusion. Correct. Yeah. And so that's where, and that's where Jordan's at right now. Yeah, so 340, 349 minus 65% is 122.15. So 65% of the of the initial enrollment people who paid money to be there dropped out. Bailed. Improvement in blood sugar, for example, and often an improvement in the kinds of psychological conditions that Dr. Chris Palmer, for example, has been studying. It's a very... Uh, gosh, I hate to bring this up too because I don't like talking about people's diseases and stuff. So Jordan Peterson has been on virtually the same diet as Michaela Peterson. It did not prevent him from having anxiety to the degree with which he became addicted to benzos. And he, he, uh, I think in 2020 had went through, um, what's it called? Rehab. Wow. So not not to speak disparagingly of Jordan Peterson, Doctor Jordan Peterson, because uh, you know people have problems, man. Like, yeah, it happens. But to suggest yeah. on the basis of anecdotal evidence that this is going to provide um, psychological, mental benefits, he can't even use his own personal experience <clears throat> to support that conclusion. We're not talking about the guy today, but there's another guy that speaks. He's a psychologist, uh, kind of an interesting, unusual cat. But one of the things that he, he, his point is, is that mental illness, mental illness impacts physical condition. Mm -hmm. And so, but I feel like what Jordan's trying to say at this point, which didn't really even apply to his own life is that. And it can, there is a, there is interconnectivity, but that, you know, diet, not dieting necessarily, but your diet has an impact on mental health. Well, mm-hmm. it does, but I think mental health has a, has an equal or greater impact on your diet. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like, there's a, a chicken and egg conundrum, you know? Yes, it is. So it's, it's yes, it's, it's, uh, it's interconnected. Faulty. Yeah, it's interconnected and it's faulty reasoning to think that just because we change the diet, therefore, yeah, 
the other one is, you know what I mean? Because if, you know, if it's backwards, if the one is driving the other, well, then you're not going to see results. Yeah. Remarkable concatenation of positive effects, some of which are quite unexpected, especially, I would say, on the depression and anxiety side, because those have been viewed for a very long time as you know, consequences of life stress and trauma, and that can happen. But the fact that the psychological disorders seem amenable to treatment by ketogenic or plant-free ketogenic diets could be nothing short of a revolution. Because those are very intractable conditions, and they're also sources of unbelievably immense suffering. I don't know a whole lot about um, dietary intervention on depression and anxiety uh, and, and all that stuff. I'm willing to bet, based on all the other other evidence of of dietary interventions on other outcomes that it probably results in non superior results than any other dietary intervention it just kind of seems like once you put somebody on a healthy dietary pattern and they lose a bunch of weight and they get out and they start doing more like a lot of these symptoms tend to go into remission or resolve so you know if if people could find success uh, on a ketogenic diet where, you know, they find it easy to adhere to and it, it ends up being all those things. Hey, great. Uh, sh being short of a revolution, like, well, as we just showed in the Verta Health, like most people just can't adhere to this diet. I don't think you're going to see a revolution. Plant-free ketogenic diets, that's a carnivorous diet, let's say, or even more restricted, a carnivorous diet that's restricted to, um, to ruminant animals, push that simplification to its extreme. Well, why would you do that? Well, if you're trying to con conduct a true scientific analysis, let's say, of the relationship between diet and health, you'd want to reduce the diet to the simplest possible underlying, what would, what would you say, the simplest possible underlying maintainable structure. And we know that that can be attained with a carnivorous diet. You can live on that for a very long time. Um, in fact, whole societies have done that, for, like the Inuit in northern Canada, and they've survived on primarily meat for, well, their entire cultural history. Uh, uh, that's a the, terrible example. Yeah, the Inuit in Canada die about a decade sooner than the rest of the people in Canada. That's a terrible example. Terrible example. I think they also have. I, I've uh, I've seen contradictory stuff on it, but I think they have a genetic mutation that actually prevents them from going into ketosis. That's. Ah, uh, come on, Jordan. That's a terrible example. So we know that that's possible. If your symptoms don't resolve in consequence, well, then there's no loss, except that it's a difficult diet to attempt. And if they do resolve, well, that's a pretty good deal for you. And then it's inexpensive, and there's going to be all sorts of corollary benefits. And then with any luck, if your symptoms do resolve and you find the diet too restrictive, you can start by introducing one food category at a time and carefully. And so with any luck, you'll be able to get back to something approximating, hopefully not a typical American diet that's sugar and carbohydrate loaded, but at least one that's varied enough to maintain your interest. None of this seems impossible. And the more I've thought about this as a sign. Um... There's the so on, much to chew on right there. Yeah, the point on sugar and carbohydrate loaded, like the the uh, standard American diet is actually quite high in saturated fat as well. It is high in sugar. Let's you know, I'm not gonna gonna say that that's not the case, but it is also high in saturated fat. Like most of what people eat are not Hostess snack cakes and Snickers bar. It's right. it's uh, McDonald's bacon, egg, and cheese. McMuffin yep, yep. in the morning, it's Whataburger yep. for lunch, and it's Pizza Hut for dinner. Yep. And and then, you know, in between there, you're having a hostess snack cake. So the, the amount of like sugary carbohydrate things in someone's diet actually makes up quite a, a smaller percentage um, than I think most people realize. And we just looked at um, the ultra processed food thing, right? And sweet snacks... Yep actually did not have that big of an effect on it because people just it just doesn't make up as big of a portion of of the the greater population not to say that there aren't people out there who sit down and eat a whole cake at one time right right but the the greater portion of the population like sweet snacks aren't making up a huge um contribution to their daily calories I came to these conclusions with great hesitancy, by the way, because I know it's quite a radical solution. But as I was thinking it through, as a scientist, it just became more and more obvious. It's like you don't want to hurt people when you're attempting to generate a solution to a health problem that they have, and a ketogenic diet certainly won't hurt them. It might help. See, I just listed off all of the adverse effects in the scientific literature for ketogenic diets. Now, we go back to this point about disproving your own hypothesis. It doesn't seem to me that Jordan Peterson did very much effort in disproving this hypothesis. Because I found that in 10 seconds. Yeah, yeah. If it doesn't, well, then you can stop doing it. It's very inexpensive. It's within 
at least in principle, within the behavioral realm that people can attain, can, can manage. And uh, it's those are fair points. Yeah. Simple enough so that you can actually do a causal analysis, plus the results. That's also a fair point. Appear quickly enough so that that's maintaining and rewarding in and of itself. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good list of positive possibilities. And so, the, there's another advantage as well with regards to ketogenic or plant-free ketogenic diets is that um, the people on them don't have to be hungry. So most of the time when people are considering something like weight loss, they think they have to go on a diet. So they need to go on a diet, they need to lose 30 pounds or 40 pounds or 50 or 100 pounds, and then the theory is they've lost the weight and they can go off the diet, which they want to do because they're always hungry on the diet and no one can maintain that, and then they go off the diet, they go back to their old eating habits, and bang, they weigh exactly what they weighed or more because that's the typical pattern as a consequence of overeating in relationship to the food deprivation. On a that's true. Uh, yeah, but as opposed to a ketogenic diet, which you only have to do once. <laughs> right yeah so, so I'm really again, <laughs> again the verda health trial weight yeah. dropped significantly at the beginning of that trial <clears throat> meaning that people were satiated and this is this is um uh not contested by anyone who's who is uh, fair-minded and and reads the scientific literature so ketogenic diets do seem to offer uh a higher degree of satiety or about six months to a year after that it doesn't seem to be any different than any other diet and those results are, are shown in that verta health trial where everybody gained most of their weight back so i'm not really sure i understand why he is hammering uh the whole thing about non-plant-based uh you know just you know just a a meat diet as opposed to what about what about a vegan diet has he given any evidence why you wouldn't do a vegan diet? Why, I didn't want to. I didn't want to bring it up, but you're absolutely right. Which I'm, dietary I'm pattern? Which dietary pattern out of all of the dietary patterns seems to have the lowest BMI, the least amount of diabetes, and the least amount of chronic diseases associated with it when people consume it from childhood into their adult years? It's a vegan, the vegan diet. diet. Yeah. Why? Why is he? Why so is he he's, on this road with he's with, he's uh, on this because meat base. Because, yeah, he's on this because um his daughter himself and his wife have you know uh, he, he preaches it a lot. They've all seemed to have found benefits consuming stuff this way. Uh so some other aspect to this is is the placebo effect, right? Um so yeah. as you listen to their stories, the way they tell their stories and how they've integrated this diet in there are be between when they tell the different the stories in different podcasts or different um like i know michaela did ted talks and stuff there are discrepancies in the timeline and so something like michaela's disease where she had juvenile idiopathic Rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so uh it's been the name's been changed to idiopathic uh oh, but it's it's rheumatoid it's yeah it's rheumatoid arthritis so but juvenile idiopathic arthritis um uh, tends to resolve itself with treatment over some number of years. I think it, the the estimates that I looked at was 15 to 20 years. So you can change something. So this is called regression to the mean where people get sick and um, you're sick for whatever, a week or something, you finally get tired of it and you're going to like, I'm going to use my grandma's old recipe of, you know, whatever, putting socks in my, or putting onions in my socks to go to bed at night. Right, and then you start to feel better the next day. Well, you you know, like it's it's possible that you just an experienced an aggression a regression to the mean, which is when we get cold, when we get colds, when we get sick, those illnesses tend to resolve themselves over some period of time. Now it can be different depending on which one you get, who you are, all these different factors. But if you're experiencing that progression of getting better of this illness on its own and that correlates with some other thing that you did that's how people develop superstitions like i know yeah. a lady i know a lady who will um take a raw egg and burn sage around her oh, house my when everybody starts getting the sniffles so wow. you know what i mean so uh, to say to say that you know uh, she she um resolved all of her symptoms well 
As it turns out, there are a large percent of people who have juvenile idiopathic arthritis who achieve symptom resolution after you know, 15 to 20 years. So what's to say that that didn't happen? And she just ended up doing this thing you know, at the same time and then saying, oh, well, that's the thing that caused my remission. Yeah. I would feel better about his, but I would feel better about a lot of what he said if, if he would say, for example, this is what works for us. Not that, yeah. not that, I think, you know, I go back to, go back to meat. And, and here's, a, and here's, and here's another issue is so just by his constant, and I'm not against the man, but in this argument, he keeps going back to a, a beef diet, basically. Yeah. Um, you know what, uh, what did we just talk about, about the science and about going in with a non-biased uh, mentality, a non-biased look. You're data. absolutely correct. Okay, but he's on this one side, and it's like, bro. Right, seriously? and the one side is entirely supported through anecdotal evidence. Yeah. Where's your data? You eat a genetic diet, you don't have to be hungry. You eat as much as you want, and they're very satiated. And so that doesn't seem to be a problem, and it's something that's sustainable in the long run. This also doesn't, I mean, again, the Verta Health trial, like, people gained weight. Yeah. There are people who start a ketogenic diet with the perp with the intention of losing weight and end up gaining weight. Yeah. The most important thing, however, as far as I'm concerned, from the scientific perspective, is the radical simplification of the causal analysis, right? If you go on a ketogenic or plant-free ketogenic diet and your symptoms remit, you know, you know that there's some relationship between what you're consuming. And again, that's not true. That you're denying the antecedent. So again, yeah. if P then Q, not P, therefore not Q. No. <laughs> Health outcome. And so that's exactly what you want to know if you're chronically ill and maybe, well, then you're fortunate as well because it's remitted. You can start to experiment and see if you can find out the actual cause. And that opens up the scientific endeavor to a much broader, in a much broader way, because that would mean that we could reduce the typical chronically ill person's diet to a ketogenic or plant-free ketogenic diet. And then we could do causal analysis with different classes of food to see which classes of food were contributing to which downstream illnesses. We already do that. We already know all of this information. And so that would be a real good deal for everyone too. And this, like this sort of scientific endeavor is, is, it's certainly technically possible. It's difficult to find participants and clinical research is a difficult endeavor, but none of this is impossible. And the additional advantage also is that it's not gonna hurt people. Uh, so the question would be, well, why haven't we done this yet? And the reason is, is that we know enough about the, uh, the outcomes of high intakes of red meat and saturated fat that it is actually unethical to perform these experiments that he's talking about. What he is discussing would not pass a board of ethics because we have so much data on those outcomes. Right. Right. And it's, a, you know, I have to say it all the time, like, as I started to read the scientific literature and I start, you start seeing these results come up over and over and over for different populations, for different, um, you know, different category, looking at all these different things and the results end up being the same repeatedly. So one of the things about the scientific process is if the results are replicable and these results are demonstrably replicable. Yeah. Okay, I agree. So Absolutely. We'll close with this. What is the most logical upward aiming scientific approach to the problem of American health? Identification of diet as the potential common mechanism, radical simplification of that diet, analysis of programmatic variation of that simplification. So, this is another logical fallacy where we are reducing all of the disease burden down to diet. By diet, as food items are added in by category one by one. Those with chronic intractable illnesses could thus well be placed by default on a plant-free ketogenic diet for the several mere months that it would take to assess the consequences. This is a revolutionary but manageable proposition. Before it becomes a generalized standard of care, however, the relevant studies should be done. We have more than sufficient anecdotal data pertaining to the positive effect of such simplified diets. The testimony of thousands of people, which is not sufficient to constitute proof, but is certainly sufficient to justify hypotheses. The goal is health. The approach is generally of upward aim and commitment to the truth. The specific strategy is restriction of all extraneous dietary variables, analysis of the consequences of that restriction, and then systematic variation with the return to a more varied diet. Simple, elegant, implementable, necessary. The alternative, given the crisis that confronts us on multiple health fronts, is dreadful. The continued sickening of the American people, with all the unsustainable economic burden that sickening is and will continue to produce. Demoralization, decline in productivity, and spiraling healthcare costs that are already mounting to the point of unsustainability. We could replace that miserable future with something much brighter and healthier. 
if we had the moral and political will to do so. As a physician. Yeah, so that concludes Jordan Peterson's speech. And uh, I'm not really sure how far we are into this recording. Are we an hour or so? No, I don't know. I'm probably maybe not even that yeah. far. I just want to say this. So first of all, I just want to say that, you know, okay, so there may be a there may be an argument made for um, how wheat has been, uh, you know, uh, altered over the years, uh, genetically engineered, blah, 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 all of those things. Uh, there may be some um, discussion about pesticides used on plants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's down, down. I mean, that's upstream in our food chain. Aside from all of that, studies have already been done as far as the health factors or the health implications of foods within our diets. And Saturated fats uh, aren't our friend. Uh, right. a, heavy, a heavy beef diet. I love beef, uh, but a heavy beef diet ultimately has some serious. At least, yeah. Just I'm just gonna say that a healthy, a healthy, uh, a, a heavy beef diet has cardiovascular in, implications, mm-hmm. and it's not because you're necessarily prone to cardiovascular uh health issues it there's there's definite causality there mm-hmm. we've already done the we we not i personally but scientists and the studies we look at have already done these things that he just got through saying about at the end of his deal there in his little conclusion area it's like i'm sorry but those studies have been done and mm-hmm. look at them with a non-biased a non-biased look Look at them. Look at them with being open to both sides of what the answer could be, and um, there's parts of his argument that I'm like, oh yeah, I'm very interested in that. But ultimately, uh, he's talking about these things and stuff we've never done them. Where on this podcast we read this stuff all the time. Yeah, and we we by have... the time. I, hold on, I got I got to say this too. And by the way, just looking at the Verda uh, uh, the Verda diet uh, the Verda study there is that. It's easy. You, you con- We constantly see this. Oh, man, I can't believe I'm this fired up. We constantly see this in the studies we look at. Maybe the abstract says something, but then the data says something else, and then their conclusion says kind of what they want it to say. I rest my case. Yeah. Can you make sense um, of that for me, Coach? <laughs> I'm just fired up, man. I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, so I think the main thing to come back to is that there there are a lot of poor arguments that are made about the way the research is conducted and that um that uh because there may be research conducted with the aim of advancing someone's career or um to publish something that uh, has the results that may benefit a certain industry. So it'll make money for someone. Um, So, so I think that becomes the main argument and then it's therefore there is nefarious things happening within it. And so you would have to, you would have to show me where, within that research. So what you're saying is, I I think what you're saying is that there is confusion about what's written in the abstract and the authors will write their own conclusions about things. And that doesn't mean that you have to accept those conclusions. You're free to challenge. You're free to challenge anyone. But if you should challenge it, we should challenge it. But if you can't show me in the methodology where your the smoking gun so to speak is boom here it is here is exactly why we would expect to see these results right then you're making a logical leap right so there right. are people who um conduct research with the goal of advancing their career they find x conclusion therefore this trial is invalid no sir that's not how that works exactly um so the other thing about this uh there's a lot of talk about 
um, corruption within these industries and stuff. And I know that you you brought up this case as well. And it's like, I understand it where, um, so they're kind of saying like, we don't want the, the food industries, we don't want representatives moving from the food industry to the pharmaceutical industry to the FDA. And we kind of have this cycle going where the people who are making the food are the same people who are making the medicine, are the same people who are the same people who are saying which medicines and what food can be in our food system. Um, I can see how someone can come to that conclusion. However, again, if something nefarious is happening, you should be able to show it to me in the recommendations uh, that people are making or the science that they're saying supports their conclusions that they're drawing. So the people who are making the food, there's a lot of talk about ingredients in this, in this round table. Uh, so the people who are making the food are the same people who go to the pharmaceutical company. So you're going to have to show me that the science that the food companies are using to make the basis that these ingredients do not appear to be harmful to humans in the, um, the amount that's recommended to be consumed. You're going to have to show me that that science is wrong. You can't just say, well, these people move around, therefore they're, they're putting poison in the food in order to make us sick so they can sell us medicine. You're going to have to show. <laughs> Am I making sense here? Yeah, yeah, you are. You are. You are. It's sometimes. Uh, and Pete, I'm, the, not, the I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm not saying that there are corrupt people. Right. But what but I'm saying are... is when we look at the recommendations that we're getting on what to eat and we look at the sign, we did a whole big spiel on artificial food colors. Yes, we did. I am willing to sit in front of a Senate hearing and debate any one of these suckers on the artificial food coloring science. And I would let you because you're way more articulate than I. But what we found is <laughs> there is no there is no data that points to conclusively that artificial dyes have anything to do with these sicknesses that that people are saying. Oh, it's the artificial dyes. No, you can't. That's right. That. It, it's it's not conclusive. Is there not is conclusive. there a link? But this this again goes to the other thing. Is there is there a link between dyes and some of these diseases? And we could say, yeah, there's a link. But let's go back to Jordan Peterson. All epidemiological evidence of a dietary intervention on an outcome fail. Right. Right. So. You know what I mean? So if they were to argue the point, well, there's a link between these things, then I'm going to say, well, Jordan Peterson just offered that. So what's the evidence that your science, your your uh, epidemiological association that you found here isn't false? Because Jordan Peterson said it is. Jordan Peterson's on your side. Yep. It's hard. So, uh, you know, we talk about uh, contradictory viewpoints. These people are holding contradictory viewpoints. I hate to say it. Now, to the broader thing about this health and nutrition roundtable, they bring up very good points like obesity is on the rise. We are burdened with chronic disease. We are spending a ton of money on health care. It would be better um, if that were not happening. I don't think that the answer is just as simple as ultra processed food. Everyone just eat beef. I don't think the answer is that simple. And again, going back to the point of trying to falsify your own hypothesis, let me tell you something about the rates of obesity and diabetes and ADD, ADHD, fatty liver, any of these things that you can name. There is a direct correlation between those rates and infant and child mortality rates. And wow. I've done this several times on Twitter where I'll take the obesity rate, so a graph that shows the the slope of the obesity rate and the infant mortality rate for the same time period, and that one goes down, this one goes up, and I'll invert it, and they correlate directly with one another. Well, let me tell you, it also directly correlates with all of these things, the rates of smoking. Several arguments have been made about, well, um, these ingredients are used in America, but not in Europe. Well... 
the rates of ADD, the rates of obesity, the rates of diabetes, and everything else have been increasing in Europe. So I'm not sure what the point of the argument is. Europe also However, has higher rates of smoking. So are we suggesting we should smoke because Europe does it to a higher degree than America does? However, those that data is not that data is not uh, reported. People don't talk about that. Oh, the, well, the the rates of obesity in Europe are going up. They are. But nobody right. says, it. oh, well, yes. no, Europe is healthier. Yeah. So oh, we should do like Denmark. Yeah, you're exactly right. What they'll do is they'll take a cross-sectional analysis, which is to say that currently the rates of obesity, I th actually think they're pretty close. Hold on. Let's look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can do this real quick, Jim and I. Bro, bro it kind of goes back to my statistic conversation what earlier, the... which, which sounded like I was crazy. It's like, we have effectively eliminated crime in the United States. No, no, you haven't. But just between these dates and between this area, only in, you know, the Rocky Mountains, we've eliminated crime. Yeah. Sometimes I hate the answers that this gives us. Uh, okay, so United States obesity as of 2024, about 40%. In Europe, it's between 10 and 30. Um, and so, again, like Europe smokes more than we do. Europe yeah. is also quite, I brought this up before, uh, Europe is also quite racially homogenous. So when we think about um, the phenotype, so the observable exterior characteristics of a person, height, hair color, skin tone, uh, eye shape and eye color and stuff, there is an Italian phenotype. There is a Danish phenotype. There is a Swedish phenotype. There is a Spaniard phenotype. There is a Greek phenotype. Germanic. Germanic. There is no American phenotype. So on the same basis, would we suggest that we become ethnically homogenous in the United States? Because that might lower the rates of diabetes. So I'm, uh, man, I'm just, I, I'm discouraged to hear stuff yeah. from these people, you know, because I hold, I do hold Jordan Peterson in high regards. I think he's quite intelligent. He's, he's very, very, um, he's been very effective and very truthful on these other fronts dealing with psychology and, um, uh, free speech and, uh, you know, all those other things that I discussed before, but then, to hear these things come out of his mouth, the same, you know, uh, logical fallacies uh, for different arguments, denying the antecedent. I, I can't. Right. And then the appeal from anecdote. He says, and anecdotally, we, you know, our family has received all these ports. That's actually a logical foul. I mean, you can just look it up, you know. Right. Appeal from anecdote is an informal fallacy when an anecdote is used to draw an improper logical conclusion. It's unfortunate. All right, man, what's up? You want to keep going or you want to stop? Oh, I think we need to stop and save the okay. next one for next week. Ooh. Yeah, this this might be three or four part. There's a lot in here. Um, we're just going to try to focus on two or three. Yeah, because just I focus think on two or three. Basically, from there on, it's uh, there's a lot of repetition. Yeah, it and is very if repetitious. You, if you guys want to watch it, just strap in, go at it. Feel free to fast forward because I will, yeah, I'll put the I'll put the YouTube link in there. Run it at at one and a half speed or one point seven five or something because it's long. <laughs> it's brutal. Yeah. So, yeah. all right. Um, I'm glad to see the topic come up. Uh, in front of in front of the Senate, uh, I'm not sure that I agree with how it was held. Like it seemed to be very one sided. Now I think that he did. So Senator Ron Johnson hosted the thing, and I think he said that it was like some part of the title of the thing was a second opinion, which I get it. Um, but it didn't seem to be 
very partisan. It seemed to be very bipartisan. It was very one-sided. Um, and then as far as like a political intervention to trying to, to solve these things, you know, like on one hand, you think like, yeah, we probably need some type of legislation to curb this. Uh, I mean, a big portion of what's going to make large changes in dealing with these things is going to have to come from food companies. It's There's no denying it. It is going to have to come from food companies. But it isn't because, quote unquote, poisons in the food. It isn't because, quote unquote, carbohydrate toxic. Uh, you know, it's just an overconsumption of food in general. Um, and people just buy food, you know, based on taste and convenience. Uh, and I'm not really sure how any of the information presented today changes our recommendations. We've gone through several iterations of the dietary guidelines. I'm not sure what changes we would make to the dietary guidelines other than everyone eats all beef. I, that's not going to be great for a population-based recommendation. No, no. But there's more factors to this. Uh, let's, I mean, just we preach it because it's, Part of our program, you know, yeah. working weights, LLC, they get out and exercise for crying out loud. Just those are, com those are components that they're not even talking about. Yeah. They say that uh, there was one thing put out at the beginning that kind of caught my ear and uh, I don't know where the data actually comes from, but uh, I think uh, RFK said 77% uh, of kids are mm -hmm. are disabled to the point that they're not eligible for the military not eligible for them that is disconcerting that that is disconcerting yeah but okay so is it just food that's causing that or is it maybe you know the fact that kids don't exercise or they they're online or too much or there's so many more components to that yeah you know, in, the, the, old, in the, the old days if you were fat you you need to join the military <laughs> you you know I hate yeah. to say that. So that, the was, infant, that was rude. But. <laughs> yeah. The infant child mortality rate plays directly into this into this thing that we're talking about here. Um, so going back through time, as the infant mortality rate was higher, then people were generally the opposite of what we're seeing today. They were less obese, less diabetic, less of all that stuff. And so what we're possibly looking at here is an example of survivorship bias where in the past, right, all the infants and children who were sicker and less metabolically fit to live life died early on. So they just didn't survive to become obese and diabetic. And as um, medical technology has improved and we're able to, you know, take better care of pregnant women and we're able to um, uh, keep keep infants a lot. We could do cesarean sections now at like what, 24 weeks and put babies in, um, uh, Oh, what are they called? I'm blanking. But anyway, you know, like we can keep, we can keep a baby alive out of the womb and they can go on to live full, happy, productive lives. And so part of, part of that medical, you know, Marvel may be that we have to accept that these people who are genetically predisposed to become obese and diabetic and are just in fact going on to live now and become obese and diabetic. And that may be a trade-off of saving lives. You know what I mean? We can't, you can't just have your cake and eat it too. Actually, I think the saying is you can't have your, you can't eat your cake and have it too. Well, it's, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You want to have a cake? You can have a cake, but if you eat it, you won't have a cake. We're off. We're There's off a logical a argument there, bro. We're off on a tangent here. Uh, all right, I'm not. You brought it, it there, bro. You brought. Any look, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So any, anywho, you know what I mean. So, do you get what I'm saying? Like, am I making my point correctly? So part I of think so. part of our um, medical technology and our ability to save lives and keep people alive, particularly at an early age. Part of the side effect of that may be resulting in these people who would have otherwise died before who were, and, and I hate to use the word weaker, but genetically weaker half of the population are now going on to live. 
And so as part of that, you know, we also have more food availability now. So you think about like, um, I think it was before the 1880s, infant and child mortality rate was almost 50% or over 50% and even higher than that going back through time. So you go back to the 15th and 13th century, you had to have a lot of kids in order to have some that survived. Yeah. Uh, so, so I want to stop you there for a second yeah. and just, and just caution you because for some people, this sounds, uh, this could sound very much like, uh, it's survival of the fittest and that's the way it should be. So it's beautiful that we have medicine that, that can save people's lives and can, uh, save a child or an infant to have a full and productive life. So we're not saying that, okay, if a kid is sickly at the beginning, you know, when born, that we should just let that kid die. That's not the point. Just no, to make no, sure that no. everybody understands yeah. that. No, it's, it's, not, it's we're not, it, we're it, not advocating, advocating. Uh, it's a good, fitness. yeah, no, no. What I'm saying is, is that there is a survivorship bias due to the fact that infant and child mortality rate was so high and what you know the the people who ended up living and becoming these healthy fit examples that everyone in this committee is referring to from the past just happened to be the genetically strongest half of the population and the only reason they went on to live is because they were strong enough to survive the harsh reality that is life. And as medical improvements came and the beautiful thing happened that we're able to save more um, uh, children and infants from death, part of it of, of doing that was we may have to accept is that now we have more people who are more prone to be to these diseases. Yes. Yeah, so that is a factor in the comparison of you know, 50, 40, 50 years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago, as to now, that's a factor. Right. And so, so talking to, as to what Jordan Peterson said about disproving your own hypothesis. So that is an alternative hypothesis that I've just laid out. And right. everything that I heard in this committee so far, I have heard zero evidence that would ex make me expect their hypothesis is more expected than the alternative. Right. I, there's zero evidence that anyone or or even just an argument that anyone made that would make me think that the alternative hypothesis is incorrect. Yep. <sighs> so there we go. That's a long one in the chapter. I will leave the link for the full thing uh, for the full Oh, goodness, what's it called? American Health and Nutrition Roundtable in the show notes. And you guys can listen to it if you want and get a better idea of what's happening. Uh, for now, I think Poppy Doral and I are all talked out. We are talked out. Uh, all right. I uh, hope you guys got something from this. And we will see you guys next time. Coach Lambie and Dwayne out. Thank you.